Now, I want to talk about this David and Goliath story this morning, and I want to start out by saying we hear this term David and Goliath a lot, and it doesn't really mean what we think it does. It's one of those stories that just gets thrown into the cultural ether, and we hear it all the time, and especially March Madness for some reason. It's kind of funny. I I am not a college basketball fan at all, but I always hear this, it's David versus Goliath in March Madness as the 16 seed takes on the number one seed. Or it's a Cinderella story. It's one of the two. It's always David and Goliath or Cinderella. But the thing is, I want to explore this story and see what it actually means. And I want to do it through the lens of four different characters. And as we go through, you should be able to identify with each of those different characters at one point or another. And guys, my iPad died on me again, so I'm just going to let you try and guess. So if the slides are off, it's because these poor guys in the back don't know where I'm going with the sermon. So my fault because the technology died again. It's been another one of those mornings. But anyway, you get the gist of it anyway. So this all takes place a thousand years before Jesus, 3,000 years ago. And Saul is the first king of Israel. And what has happened is the Philistines have indulged in their national pastime. Some people like to watch baseball. Some people like to watch football. The Philistines like to invade Israel. It's what they did. And they'd get into Israel. And this time what they've done is they drew up at the Valley of Elah. And they said, you know what? Let's do this the easy way. Instead of fighting army to army, let's send out our champion. You send out your champion. And whoever wins, wins. And so the Philistines send out Goliath. And Goliath is six cubits and a span tall. Now, in case you're trying to remember back to elementary school how big a cubit is, a cubit is a distance between here and here. It's about 18 inches, elbow to the tip of your middle finger. And a span is if you make this gesture, it's from your thumb to the tip of your forefinger, or tip of your little finger, about nine inches. So Goliath is nine feet tall, give or take. And he is this mountain of a human being, and he's wearing a couple hundred pounds of armor, and he stands out in front of the Israelites, and he says, send out your man, and we'll fight. And if I win, all of Israel becomes our slaves. And if you win, the Philistines become the slaves of the Israelites. Let's do this thing. Now, this seems crazy to us. But in the mindset of people back in the day, it made perfect sense. And there's a certain logic to it, which is that each of these champions is a proxy for the two gods. And so whichever god is stronger, the god of the Philistines or the god of the Israelites, their champion will win. Makes sense. You don't have to have all this messy army fighting. It's just the Goliath versus the champion of the Israelites, winner take all. So Goliath stands out in front of the Israelite army for 40 days, and he taunts them. Every day he goes out and says, come on, send your guy. Come on, let's do this thing. Come on, I'm standing here in the sun. Come on, have you no guts? 40 days he does this. And I love the way that passage that Sue just read for us goes. Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And this is when David comes into the story. David, at this point in his life, is a shepherd, and he's got older brothers with his army, with the army, and his father has sent him with a bunch of food to bring to his brothers and some cheese for the officers. Because who doesn't love cheese? Absolutely. Okay. I love cheese. Anyway, so anyway, brings the cheese and the food to the army, and he hears this, and he hears what's going on with, David, with, with, with Goliath, and he asks this great question, will no one rid us of this uncircumcised Philistine? you got to love that as an insult, uncircumcised Philistine. We need to bring that one back. Try it around the house. What uncircumcised Philistine drank the last of the milk and then put the container back in the fridge? <laughs> Trust me, it works. Okay? But it is a cultural 
slur and it is an attack on their religion and it's all these things and it's basically saying he's less than a human being and he's mocking the living God and he's upset about it and he starts asking around and he says how come nobody's done anything and people start telling him well look yeah Saul the king has offered this reward if you kill Goliath, you get three things. You get a truckload of money, you get to marry the princess, and your family never has to pay taxes again. And I will tell you this, as a young man, I thought the princess was the best part of the deal. But being firmly ensconced in middle age, I'm thinking the taxes might be the best part of that. Well, you, yeah, we can, we can have a church poll on that one later. Um, but yeah, so they say you get those three things. Princess, money, no taxes. Heck of a deal. And David's like, well, somebody's got to do this. And at this point, David's brother starts saying to David, why are you doing this? You don't have any right to do this. You know, what's interesting, and I find this really fascinating. Because at this point, David is a shepherd. But David knows, and David's brothers know, that he's going to be king someday. You see, Saul is the first king of Israel, and God has made Saul the king of Israel, but Saul has fallen away. Saul has started to mess up. Saul has done things he should not have done. So in that condition, David sends Samuel, the prophet. David, excuse me, God says, to David, God says to Samuel, I want you to go to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse, and ask to see his sons, and I will show you which one of those sons you are supposed to anoint as the future king. And so Samuel does what he's supposed to do. He gets to Jesse's house, and he says, let me see your sons. And they bring him out, the oldest first. And he's tall, and he's good looking, and he's smart, and he's handsome. And God says, not this one. And the same thing throughout the rest of the sons, until finally he gets down to David, the youngest and smallest of all the sons. Because God looks into the hearts of these young men and says, it should be David. So David's brother was passed over for being king and is letting God be mocked by this Philistine. And so he's angry about it. How many times... Have we ever been angry or jealous at somebody else's call? When God calls somebody we know or we don't know or something that we want, and God says, yeah, I want this person to do this thing, and you're like, I could have done that. I could have been part of that, and I would have done it great. Back when I was in seminary, my home church was experimenting with this Saturday night Generation X service because it was the 90s and everybody was contractually obligated to experiment with some Generation X experimental Saturday night service and everybody was doing it and we were doing it and we were trying it out. And church leadership had decided that somebody should be the dedicated preacher for that service and it was going to be a part-time job and you would preach every week and you get a little bit of money and I thought I wanted this job. I wanted that job so bad. It was my home church. It was a great job. You got to experiment. You got to do different stuff. I wanted it so bad, and I thought it would have been great. And they gave the job to a friend of mine. They gave the job to a friend of mine who I had brought down and introduced and said, hey, we're doing this new thing on Saturday night. You should come check it out. Oh, that burned. I was mad for like six months. Because it was like, not only did I not get the job, I introduced the guy who got the job. I was like, oh. And in that six months, before I finally figured out, you know what, James is doing a great job. He's doing a better job than I would. And frankly, it's a lousy job. There was a lot of things I missed because I was angry about stuff, I was frustrated, I wasn't putting effort into it. 
How many times have we been in that where we say, I could have done that and I would have done it better. And in the process, we miss what God is doing and we miss what God is calling to because we're so angry, because we're so frustrated. It's a natural trap to fall into. So eventually David comes to the attention of the king because he's like, I want to go fight Goliath. I want to go take him down. I can do it. And Saul looks at him and says, you can't. You're a shepherd, not a warrior. And David says, no, 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 no. This is it. I can do this because I am a shepherd. He says, look, I have to watch my father's animals. When there's a bear or a lion, I kill the bear or the lion and rescue the animal. I have done it before. I can do this again. It's not quite the same, but the principles are the same. I can take down this Goliath. And this gives us another point. You see, we all have these experiences in the past, these things that God has used and will continue to use for the future. You see, think about the last year. Nobody had been through and tried to do ministry in the context of 2020. Nobody had done this in living memory. Last time we dealt with a pandemic like this was 102 years ago. But God had used other things in our lives and gave us experience to come out of these things, to learn, to try, and be able to share his love even in these difficult things. And so the question that David asks us today is what experiences in the past is God using in your life now? Each one of those experiences you have, each trial, each thing you have faced gives you another tool, gives you more experience, lets you see with new wisdom. Part of being around long enough and building up experience is just saying, oh yeah, this reminds me of that time when God had us do that. There is wisdom in those things. What things, what bears, what lions have you dealt with in the past that have taught you how to face the Goliath today? So David is talking to Saul, and Saul says, okay, fine, you convinced me, you can go do it. Now here, put on my armor. And Saul slaps his armor on David and says, you go do it now. Now keep in mind that David is a teenager and Saul is probably a foot taller than David. And so as David does this, it doesn't fit. And he has to take all the armor off. Now, this shows us something else. How many times has God called somebody to do something? And you're thinking, here, that's great. Go do it exactly the way I would do it. When we want new people or somebody else to do something exactly the way we want to do it, exactly the way we've done it in the past, and we don't give them the opportunity to do it a new way or to do it a different way as they have been gifted and used by those experiences. Those bears and those lions have shaped them, and God is using that in their lives. There's probably 200 people passing through here this morning between the three services and online. Each and every one of us has a different path, has a different set of gifts. And when we try and shove everybody into the same cookie cutter mold, we lose the uniqueness and the individuality that God has gifted us with. It shows different ways. So David takes off the armor, grabs his sling, and heads out to face Goliath. And Goliath taunts David and says, I am going to kill you so dead. And David says, nope, because I come at you in the name of the living God. I'm going to cut off your head and leave your body out for the birds to eat. Now, when I say David had a sling, we often think of the old Bart Simpson thing, you know, where you got the Y-shaped thing with the elastic. That's not what we're talking here. We're talking a long wooden rod here, like really long. 
with a nice leather pouch or strap on the end. And what you would do is you would use that lever, that rod, to create a lot of leverage. And the end of that thing would whip really fast. And you could throw that rock fast enough to kill somebody. That was a whole idea. The Romans, a thousand years after the time of David, would actually employ whole auxiliary units full of slingers mm -hmm. as artillery. And we all know how the Romans handled <laughs> conquering. They did a really good job with it. So David has his five smooth stones in his sling, and he lines up the first one, and he nails Goliath right in the forehead. Goliath goes down. Goliath. And then David takes Goliath's sword and cuts off his head and shows everybody what happened. The Philistines run off in terror, and David eventually keeps the head as a trophy and takes it back to Jerusalem. Now, there's a couple of things I want to pull out of this last thing. First thing, part of the reason that I think David could face down Goliath is he knew he was going to be king. He knew that God had a destiny for him. He knew that God had a plan for him. And that as part of that, he would be king someday. And in the short time, short run, it was going to be scary. But he knew that that was his destiny. And friends, you and I face trials in our world, but we know that God is always with us and that we will be in heaven someday. Because knowing that our eternal reward is in heaven and whatever trials we have now, whatever troubles we have now, that Jesus is bigger, those, bigger than those, lets us face the Goliaths in our world. Because we know that whatever happens in this world, we will see God face to face and be in heaven, a place of no more tears and no more sorrow. And I want to ask one last question. How did Goliath become Goliath? Now, I know the obvious answer is really tall parents, but that's not what I'm getting at. How did he become this mountain of a human being taunting the living God, making mockery out of the one who created the universe? That is a fascinating question. Now, you could make a cop-out answer and say, well, he's a Philistine. He didn't have any choices. I don't believe that. The Philistines, as I said, invaded the Israelites on a constant basis. They were familiar with the Israelites. They even intermarried, even though they weren't supposed to. They knew God well enough to mock him. He could have worshipped the living God. You see, in both the Old and the New Testament, there is a place for people coming from outside of Christianity, of people, people who uh, disobey or have fallen away or have never heard. There is a place for them to come into faith. Indeed, when they build the temple, there is even a court for the foreigners, a place for them to come and worship. It's all in there. And Goliath was certainly no worse than others who came to faith. I would make a case that Paul in the New Testament was a much worse threat to early Christianity than Goliath was to the nation of Israel. See, Goliath chose to mock God. Goliath could have chosen to follow God. And it probably smarted small, but eventually this path that he was on led him to this place where he's standing in front of the whole nation of Israel, taunting them, and by proxy, taunting God. And my question for you is, have you ever been on that path, or are you on that path now? Of stepping out and saying, you know what, I'm going to make this choice. And I'm going to make this next bad choice, and I'm going to make this next bad choice, and we keep justifying it. 
It's easy for us to justify it. It's easy for us to delude ourselves and say, it's just this one thing. It's just this little thing of cheating on my taxes or dishonoring my spouse or doing this other thing that I know I shouldn't do, but I feel like I can or I deserved it or I want to do it now. And we do that one step at a time until you end up in the Valley of Elah facing down a shepherd with five smooth stones. So here's my question for you today. How do you identify with these four characters? How do you respond to each of them? And I want to ask you, how do you respond to each four, all four of them? Because if I asked you, which one do you identify with? Everybody would just say, David. We just all would go with that. So no cheating. How do you look at the challenges and the questions asked by each of these? And how does it apply to your life? You see, that is the beauty of the Bible. It is this wonderful piece of literature, this wonderful piece of art, which resonates with us 3,000 years after the story took place. Yes, it's history. Yes, it actually happened. But it is deeper than that. And it asks these fundamental questions of who we are. As you go through this week, ponder and meditate on these roles and how your life plays out today in the challenges that you face. Amen.